Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where today we're looking at the GVP for the third time, and it's all because of a recent release of the Blue Scuzzy version 2. This, much like my V1, is a kit, so I'll have to assemble and solder it. And while that's going on, let's have a quick recap. As the Blue Scuzzy is a, well, Scuzzy emulation device, and one that mostly looks to take the place of a hard drive. And it used the Blue Pill development board. And the issue was, well, with the Amiga, how unstable it was. As reads, and far more likely writes, would end up crashing the SCSI host, and then typically the machine not long afterwards. Now I managed to work around it by adding a few extra delays in there, but it wasn't a good fix, as it didn't take much to break those timings. If you want more details on the V1, then I'll include a link to my previous video down there somewhere, probably in the description. Now, since then, there have been some code improvements that did make it a little bit more stable. That, for the most part, it was quite happy to do reads from the card, but writes, well, there was still a bit of a dice roll, and trying to format it, well, that was completely out. And thankfully, those in the Blue Scuzzy community continued to look into this issue, as it wasn't just a problem with Amigas, it was pretty much any device that was Scuzzy 2 and it was something to do with the voltage levels, that the blue pill on its own couldn't quite do what was required from the more exacting standard. So Androda, sorry if I got your name wrong, released a version with bus transceivers that greatly increased its reliability and compatibility. And for a while I was looking at getting one of those kits and putting it together. But while this was going on, a V2 was being designed, and it launched at the start of 2023. And it would have bus transceivers by default, and it would move on from the slower blue pill to the Raspberry Pi Pico. And what did this do to affect the price? Well, I bought mine from Flame Lily, as I'd done with my V1. And this do-it-yourself kit that includes a pre-flash Pico cost, at the time of recording, 38 British pounds. Now a similar Blue Scuzzy V1 kit is currently 30 pounds, so it has added a little bit to the price, but not by much. And if it works as claimed, then that extra 8 quid will be well worth it. And if you don't want to do all the soldering yourself, well there's fully completed boards that you can buy, but they will cost you more. And with that, it's built. So let's fit it inside the HD8. Now it's still powered by the floppy style Berg connector, as the GVP doesn't provide enough power over the SCSI cable, and there's also two jumpers that we should fit. The first is to set it to terminate the SCSI bus, the second is to tell the card to also power the Pi Pico as it can be powered by the USB port that's on it if you need to debug it or do other things with it. I'm using the same SD card as before, with the same drive images that I used before, so it's now time to start it up. And it seems to detect the drive image straight away And wow, just look how quickly that's gotten up to a workbench screen. That's incredible. And without any issues as well. No warning messages, no errors, nothing. A nice, clean boot. As I have all the same files on the disk image that I had before, I can run the exact same test that I ran previously. Which was this real world test that I set up that would copy about 3 megabytes of files and folders to and from the drive and the RAM disk. And after just 30 odd seconds, the results are in. 
and taking the mechanical drive as our baseline, it could read at 177 kilobytes a second and write at 181 kilobytes a second on average. The V1 on the other hand could read about 179 kilobytes a second and when it worked, wrote at about 186 kilobytes a second. So how does the V2 stack up? Well, the reads are 233 kilobytes a second, with the writes hitting 286 kilobytes a second. That is quite the dramatic improvement. But what does everyone's favourite test suite, Sysinfo, has to say? Well, I never got around to testing it with a mechanical drive, as it's not particularly happy at the moment. And it gave me some issues when I tried it before. So let's just leave this as a straight fight between the drive emulators, and we get the V1 with a speed of 1.1 megabytes a second, and the V2 with a speed of 1.5 megabytes a second. So again, it's showing a decent improvement in speed. But speed really wasn't the issue that I had with the V1, as just trying to prep a drive image via the device wasn't easy going. So let's try this out with the GVP provided software, Fast Prep. And this time, it doesn't hang or crash the system. It doesn't show the right size, but it's a definite improvement on what it was before. So we can already see that compatibility has increased a notch. But let's try it out with the Amiga install disk. Now it still gives us a warning that we got before that you can skip over. But we can now define the partitions and then write them out to the drive and then format it all without a single error or crash from the GVP. I think it's clear to say that I'm very impressed with how the V2 is doing, and let's try out a few games. And they all loaded very quickly, with it not mattering if it was a WHD load game or a regular one that supported installing to a drive. And installing new games to it, well, that was painless as well. Well, as painless as swapping multiple discs can be. But I didn't get a single hang or error during that time. This was really what I was hoping the V1 was going to be like when I bought it back then. But what if we really wanted to give this a real workout? In say, an Amiga 4000? Well inside mine I have a Warp Engine CPU accelerator board, and it has the 50 pin SCSI interface built into it. So let's try running our tests again. And this time the real world results are its speed and write were over 2 megabytes. With Sysinfo giving us a speed of 7.6 megabytes a second. Which I guess goes to show that either the CPU or the GVP was the real bottleneck in that Amiga 500 Plus. And while this absolutely flies in the Amiga 4000, for now, it's returning back to the GVP, as, well, it's really the only way I have of adding a hard drive to that machine. But I am now very tempted to get a second one to put it inside this Amiga 4000. 
with gaming being the real focus of the 500 plus, I also wanted to make it a little easier to get software on and off the drive. And having to open it up every time to get to the SD card wasn't ideal. Which is where this SD card extension cable comes in. As with a bit of effort, it should just fit in one of the vents where the fan used to be. And it ends up with the SD card being flush with the top of the case. It does mean I need to poke at it with something to get it to insert or to get it to pop out. But I think it does look quite clean and neat. If it was the exact same colour, oh, that would have been perfect. And with the extension cable being wedged in quite nicely, I don't have to worry about it moving. But I might add some hot glue to it just to make sure that doesn't happen. But if I do, it'll all be inside and hidden away, so it will be still quite nice. And when combined with the upgrades that I made in the last video, this is now a GVP with 4 megabytes of RAM and really any size hard drive that the OS can support. At the moment, it's a 500 megabyte drive split across two partitions, with Workbench 2.04 being the OS, mostly due to being the version of Workbench that I got with the machine, plus it has say, which is always fun. And the other partition is where the games and software goes. Now seeing I can have multiple images on the card, and with a simple rename switch between the drive images, plus you can just point WinUI at any of those images on the SD card and it will boot it into the exact same OS in the emulator. The other bonus of the SD card being like this is that you can upgrade the software on the Pi Pico via the card. So you don't need a special dongle or having to plug it in via USB, you just drop a bin file on the SD card and boot. And thankfully, because the HDA is now completely powered by the Amiga's expansion bus, I don't even have to worry about an external power brick or any noisy fans. Which does mean there isn't too much in the way of upgrades that I can do to this HD8. More games benefit from extra chip RAM than fast, so I've ended up fitting a 1MB expansion into the trapdoor, which means I now have 2MB of chip RAM and 4MB of fast, so that should be plenty. If I could find that x86 CPU card that you could fit inside of it, now that could be interesting, but to be honest, I think trying to upgrade the Amiga CPU might be far more beneficial. As I have been looking at some of those clock speed doubling kits, as I think that could be quite nice. And it would really help round out those edges on some of those point and click adventures. You know, the ones that came on a huge number of discs. Or even all those strategy games that love to be installed and would use faster CPUs if it found them but I think that would have to be a subject for another video. And until next time, I was the Gouldfish, that was the HD8++++++, and this was Gouldfish on Games. Thanks for watching this revisit of a revisit of the HD8 and the Blue Scuzzy. If you found it interesting or useful, then there's some buttons down below that will let YouTube know that or you can drop me a comment, as I always enjoy hearing from viewers. Or you could check out some of my other videos, as two will be shown up on the screen right now.